Hey, my name's Lilika. If you're a coder who's just taking computer science as an extra subject because you won't really have to study for it, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but I, <laughs> I'm the bearer of bad news. Cambridge computer science, I found to be a mostly theoretical subject. This is not only because they really like going in super deep on tech, like you'll be learning the intricacies of <laughs> 17 types of printers and also more on ethics or like, if you'll get thrown in prison if you do something like pirate a movie. It's also because the actual practical coding that you'll be doing will be mostly sorting algorithms and also written on paper, which means you'll probably never come in contact with a computer in your computer science syllabus. Actually, that's not entirely true for IG computer science. They give you what's called pre-release material, which is essentially a problem that they give you and you have to code a solution. In the actual practical exam on that paper, they'll ask you questions where you'll have to reference the code that you'd written for the pre-release material. So, Technically, you will be coding there. For AS computer science, as far as practical coding, they did give pre-release material, but they didn't ask any questions on it in my paper when I was doing it in 2019. So definitely check to make sure, check your syllabus and check your papers to see whether they're gonna be asking you questions on the pre-release material. But that's about as far as the practical coding goes. The rest is just written on paper and general theory. So I'd advise you to not pick the subject if you've like done a bit of scratch and like to call yourself a coder. The computer science for Cambridge is mostly theoretical. So yeah. Anyway, with that out of the way, let's kind of move on now that we've shaved the poses off of the demographic of people who clicked on this video. <laughs> Cambridge computer science has a volume of information that will rival even the most sophisticated of biology courses. Really, there is a lot of information to memorize. So like I've talked about before, you want to take that tidal wave of information and break it down into bite-sized chunks so that even if 90% of your brain is panic stricken, you still have at least like three brain cells that can function to try to study the material. The most obvious way to break down the material is to just look at the syllabus. I'll leave a link in the description for the official Cambridge website where you can find the computer science syllabus for your year that you're doing your examinations. On there, they'll have a list of all the concepts and principles and general bits of theory that you need to know. If you're anything like me, you suffer from mind numbing panic if you don't schedule your learning and let me tell you schedule I did. I used to schedule every hour of every day for weeks in advance when it came to my studying and revision. And though that didn't go too badly for me, like my grades weren't anything to be ashamed of, I could definitely tell back then that there might be a more effective or efficient way to be going about things. The problem in my opinion with the way I was, and you may be now scheduling your learning, is that that really rigid hour for hour timetable kind of makes you focus more on adhering to your timetable than you focus on just actually understanding the content of your syllabus. This is bad since the entire point of Cambridge examinations is to test your understanding. So there's the problem laid out for you. Now, enter the retroactive timetable. Firstly, what even is it? Well, it looks like a list of all the topics and principles that you need to know for your exam, which is why I mentioned the syllabus that you can use previously, because instead of having to break down the information yourself, you can just use the syllabus as your kind of uh, framework for your timetable. The way you use this list is by logging each time you spend time revising or studying one of the topics on the list. This is how you keep track of the time you spend and how much time you allocate to each topic. So you can make sure to spend more time on the difficult topics and less time on the easier topics. The way you keep track of your understanding, after you spend time studying or revising a certain topic, you'll kind of reflect a bit on how well you thought you understood or recalled the information in that topic. So, for example, red would be terribly, orange would be meh, and green would be like pog or, <laughs> or like good, you know, you can understand it well. The point of this scheme is for you to be able to keep track of your understanding so you don't fall prey to the comfort and 
full sense of security that long but really ineffective studying sessions uh, tend to give you. Like with the retroactive timetable, you could spend four hours studying a subject, but really spend two hours <laughs> browsing TikTok or something. But at the end of the day, this timetable will force you to reflect and be honest with yourself about how well you actually understand the work after you've studied it. And that'll help keep you accountable. And that's very epic. There we go, problem solved. So you might be saying, okay, that's all well and good, but some topics will take longer to cover than others. And realistically, you can't spend like three weeks on one concept. Well, I've already thought of that. So what I did was I calculated an upper bound for the amount of days that I could spend on each topic. I even came up with this super complicated formula. It's, um, it's actually really hard for me to share this with you because of how long it took me and how much fine tuning it took to really make this as effective and able to give you an accurate an answer as possible. But um, I'm gonna give it to you anyway. So I really un hope you understand how much of an honor this is. Here it is. Genius. <laughs> so what that number will mean is that you can't spend any more days than that on a topic, otherwise you'll run out of time and you'll cry. Okay, again, you might be thinking, that's starting to feel very constrictive again, like <laughs> wrong again, buddy. <laughs> to solve this problem, I came up with another ingenious solution. I like to call it the credit system. So essentially how it works, instead of the upper bound being a hard time limit, it's more like a rough estimate. Since harder topics will take longer to cover, you should always aim to spend a smaller percentage of your upper bound on the easier topics so you can use the leftover percentage of your upper bound and kind of allocate that to the harder topics and literally problem solved. So in summary, if you keep track of your understanding and keep your timetable flexible and constantly evolving, you'll be forced to take more responsibility for your learning and will avoid the subtle procrastination that having a set timetable to fall back on can encourage. And there's that. Okay, next. All right, so now that we have planning out of the way, we can finally <laughs> move on to actually studying. Fun fact, many studies have shown that the studying techniques that we tend to find the most effective and easy to use are actually the worst you can be using and don't promote long-term memory consolidation at all. I know, shocking. We are all clowns. One method that has been scientifically proven to promote long-term memory consolidation and strengthen those neural pathways of yours is called space repetition. Essentially, the reason we find studying methods that are really ineffective, scientifically speaking, such as reading and rereading, to feel super effective is because when we are using them, our brains kind of feel comfortable, which um, essentially means that we aren't using our brain. <laughs> That's exactly what space repetition tries to combat. Essentially, the idea behind it is that the longer you wait before you attempt to recollect or remember information that you study, the harder it will be to remember. And the harder it is to remember, the stronger that neural pathway of that memory will become and the easier it will be to remember in the future. All right, so that's the theory behind it, but let's get into how to actually use it. What I did was, instead of taking notes, I just made flashcards. Flashcards are better for two reasons. One, it's like an eighth of an A4 paper, which means you can't extrapolate like an entire monologue from one sentence in your textbook. They force you to be concise. And two, you'll actually use them after you make them. <laughs> okay, for all you study blur people who didn't instantly click off of this video the moment I started shading your perfectly made notes, riddle me this. How often after you make notes do you actually use them? That's what I thought. The key principle here with flashcards is that the writing down of the information isn't the act of memorization. Rather, the recalling of the information is the act of memorization. Remember, in the past, we've already shamed writing down stuff as a bad way to memorize. Like, this is scientifically proven, just let go. <laughs> okay, so in summary, basically, our brains are lazy. They don't like being used. And because of this, we fall in love with really ineffective studying methods that don't really ask for much when it comes to our cognitive functions, 
when it's in fact actually the studying methods that feel really hard to use that really engage our brains and promote long-term memory consolidation. Hence, we use flashcards, revising the cards that we get wrong more often than those that we get right in an attempt to space out our repetition, to make it a bit more difficult to recall, to really strengthen those neural pathways, which is really what memorization is. Cambridge Computer Science allows for three coding languages. Yes, I'm right. Visual Basic, Python and Java. They removed Pascal slash Delphi um, a while ago, as of when this video is being recorded. So just check your textbook. It should enlighten you on which coding languages you're allowed to be using. But if your textbook is anything like mine was, it spends a lot of time talking about the minute details of like different data types and matrices, matri matrix, matrices. But I'd encourage you to spend more time actually coding and applying those principles practically, since that is the only way you'll really begin to understand what they mean and what they are useful for. How deep you want to go is really up to you and what you want to do for your as your future profession. If you're not super into programming, I guess you don't really have to go too deep underneath the surface level stuff that the book is teaching you. But again, Cambridge really is all about your understanding and the exams will test your understanding. Believe me, <laughs> I know. I am someone who has a bit of a background in coding, so I might be slightly biased when I say this, but I found the IG and AS practical paper for programming to be at a level that isn't really that difficult. So unless you're doing something in coding in the future, um, and if you're not, I don't really know why you're taking the subject, but I guess you don't really have to do this, but I'd still suggest maybe doing like a coding course on the side to supplement your learning. Code Academy is great. I'll leave a link in the description. They allow you to apply the principles you're learning right as you learn them, which again is the only way you'll really begin to understand what coding is. So I guess spend less time learning about the theory of coding and more time actually coding and problem solving because that's what coding is. It's just problem solving. Okay, lastly, I would like to talk about one last studying method and this one's a kicker. So buckle up kids. I know I've been shaming the collective student body on how lazy we are for the entirety of this video, but allow me to do that one last time. Okay, so I've mentioned that the studying methods that we tend to enjoy using are generally relatively low utility when it comes to long-term memory consolidation, right? I've been talking about this over and over again, you get it. Well, what I tactically haven't mentioned yet in this video is that there was a studying method that really stood the test of time and rose to the top as all the other studying methods fell away. And that method is called active recall. Now, Lily, what is active recall? Well, I made an entire video on it <laughs> just for you. I cover what it is, studies that back it up, practical ways you can actually implement it in your learning, stuff like that. So, you know, after you watch this video, you'll never have to watch any other videos on studying ever again. <laughs> Go check it out. I would highly suggest it. Active Recall is really the best when it comes to up and coming studying methods. And in my opinion, if you don't start using it, you'll get left behind. So go check that video out. That's really all I have to say. Thank you so much for watching this video and good luck on your studying journey. Watch the video.